Hey yo, and what is up, gang? Thank you so much for checking out Sledgehammer TV here tonight. It is Monday, once again, December the 11th, 2017, which means that you are here for your official Monday night Raw review, and this is gonna be a doozy. So, let's do it. <laughs> Wrestling fans, thank you so much once again for joining me. My name is Nick Nightmare. Along with me is the World Heavyweight Champion of Microphones, Blue the Snowball, my trusty tag team partner and loyal companion. And welcome to the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show right here on Sledgehammer TV for your Monday Night Raw review on this December the 11th. Good God, this show was a disaster. And that is the most appropriate word that I could think of, especially when I think of what I just had to witness in the last 10 minutes of this show. Let alone the fact that we had to see Kane once again. That, in and of itself, is a tragedy. It's a damn tragedy. And it shouldn't be happening in the year 2017, let alone in the main event. Kane has been in the main event seemingly all month long. How many times has Samoa Joe been in the main event this year? How many times has Finn Balor been in the main event this year? Absolutely unacceptable. And then when you get what we got as a main event, that match, I wouldn't even call it a match. What you, Whatever you want to call it, that was worse than garbage. That was an abomination of wrestling. Here you have two gigantic men who were clearly blown up two minutes into their five minute long match. And that's not even the biggest problem. The performance aspect was definitely not the biggest thing that upset me. Even though it was absolutely ugh, just some of the worst wrestling I have seen on a Monday Night Raw all year. Maybe the worst match of the year. Kane couldn't even deliver his own signature choke slam. I don't care. I don't care that Braun Strowman is seven feet tall, 300 and something pounds. If you can't do it effectively, don't do it. Don't do it. Because you looked like a weak, pathetic shell of what the big red machine used to be. I'm sorry. I'm putting it out there. The hammer is being brought down on the WWE right now. For them to truly think and look at Kane as a viable threat to anybody anymore is a joke. It was like watching a comedy. It was a parody of a main event. It was so bad. It was just so bad. These guys looked like two trees that were planted in the ground and there wasn't a breeze to move a branch. It was terrible. Their timing was awful. The execution was dreadful. And all of this was supposed to lead to us knowing who was going to be Brock Lesnar's opponent for the Royal Rumble. Now, they have been saying Brock wasn't going to be at the Bro at the Royal Rumble. He was supposed to initially fight Finn Balor at the Royal Rumble, and we'll get into the ruination of Finn Balor in a few minutes. He was supposed to be slated to be going up against somebody else who was going to be get some sort of a push. Now, I absolutely did not believe that Kane was going to beat Braun Strowman and be the opponent for Brock Lesnar. At the Royal Rumble. However. By having this match end in a no contest. And having a double count out. When you all night long. Kept repeating the fact that we were going to know conclusively. And decisively. 
who was going on to face the beast. And then you give us a match that has no outcome. Is absolutely nonsensical. Nonsensical. If you're not going to have the conclusion and have finality, why drag us along for a seemingly eternal three hours for you to give us nothing? It's like promising us a five-star steak dinner and then showing up and getting a, a Salisbury steak and some noodles. You know what I mean? You wanted the filet mignon. You wanted the rib steak, the nice inch and a half piece, right? But you get a little ball that's sh- it's a hamburger. It's just a hamburger with some fucking gravy. Are you kidding me? That main event is an embarrassment to professional wrestling. It doesn't matter if it was Kane or not. Kane only makes it that much worse. But if the performance that we got tonight out of Braun Strowman is any indication of the performances that he can put on with people that can't wrestle or do not have the ability to do what they used to do, then Braun Strowman's career is not in as good of hands as we thought. I don't know if that's proper grammar, but whatever. I'm all fucking revved up. Because that was just ridiculous. Braun Strowman did not look like a monster. He looked like a monkey. Kane looked like a big red garbage pail. Stumbling around in the wind. At one point, he just fell. He fell. Braun Strowman was on the floor. Kane was beating his ass with a chair. And then he just fell. He just fucking fell. Because he couldn't breathe. The man was winded 60 seconds into the match because he's 50 years old. He's crawling to the mayoral race in Tennessee because the man can't run. He can't run because he'll get winded and he'll fall. So obviously he's tiptoeing or or gently, gracefully stepping his way in his mayoral race. It's not actually a race at all, because as we've seen tonight, Kane's got no wind left in him, so how can he run for anything? Holy shit, you guys. What an embarrassment. And that was just the main event. We're just getting started. And I'm going off on it because it just happened. It's fresh in my mind, and I want to say everything that I feel about it right now. It's a goddamn travesty. And then we get no finality. And you think I'm stupid, WWE? I see where you're going with this. I know we got some time, and I might be proven wrong, and that's just fine. It won't be the first time I've been wrong. But I can feel it in my bones what they're going to do. They have nobody in their mind that is of the level of Brock Lesnar. They want to preserve him for the Roman initiative, right? So they don't want Brock Lesnar to take the loss. They still, even though they have him booked in this feud from hell with Kane, obviously hold Braun Strowman in such high regard. Do you see the crowd reaction when Braun's music hits? And you hear that, Braun! And then you see almost everybody in attendance rise to their feet. That's because Braun Strowman is over. He does not need a feud with Kane to be put over any further. You're only doing damage to him by having him involved with Kane. It's not furthering anything. You're just going to further damage the legacy of Kane, which, you know, no pun intended on the video game. It's just, it's already been ruined just in this final run, in my opinion. The man has a Hall of Fame career, and he's ruining it with each and every appearance this year. And all this is leading to, because like I said, you think I'm stupid and I can't see the writing on the wall, but I'm a very good reader. And I could read pro wrestling like I could read the back of my head. And all I can tell you is, if you don't see a triple threat match in the future, probably at the Royal Rumble... Between the Beast, the Universal Champion, Braun Strowman and Kane for the Universal Championship, then you don't know as much about wrestling as you think. This is definitely the direction in which they're going. Why would they do this, you would ask, right? Because Kane's only mission in that match is to be the one to lose. 
He, they're not going to take the Universal title off of Brock Lesnar. So if you put him one-on-one -on -one against Braun Strowman, Strowman's going to take the loss, and his career is going to be further dug down into the depths where it's seemingly on its way and not being able to rise back up. If he takes another loss clean to Brock Lesnar, there is no coming back for, for Braun Strowman. There is no more marquee matches. There is only the territory of the big show where he resides and guys like Kali. You know, that's where he will end up. And that's not what we want for Braun Strowman. This guy's potential is limitless. And you are going to have him in this triple threat match. And he won't lose. Kane's there just to have his shoulders pinned. Or to be the one to tap out to Brock Lesnar. So that Braun Strowman doesn't lose. And Brock stays your champion on his way. On the road to WrestleMania. Or as we sh like to call it here. On the way to Roman Mania 34. That's it. There you go. There is the plans. And if that really were, uh, was their intention, why book the match with the stipulation that the winner moves on? It's a false tease. It's clickbait. And we don't like that kind of shit. We don't do that stuff here. And we definitely don't like when we're a fallen victim of such false advertising. Promised us resolution. You gave us nothing. And I can't accept that. This show, in essence, was just a repeat of last week. I think they figured, you know, hey, everybody kind of dug last week's show, right? Everybody was talking good. Everybody said it might have been one of the best roars of the year, which it definitely was. It was all pretty much based off the buzz of Woken Matt Hardy and the Broken Universe finally debuting on WWE TV. Coupled with the fact that we had some great wrestling on a Monday Night Raw for once. So they actually tried to copy that formula. And you would think that that would be, you know, a way to repeat your results, right? But when you do it almost exactly, and most of the segments don't make sense or just are a mishmash or repeat of what we've seen last week... We're not that dumb. I see it for what it is. They saw we put on a good show, so let's just put it on that one again because we have too much time until the next pay-per-view. So let's just hit the repeat button and we'll move a little bit forward. We'll take baby steps or we'll just take side steps is more like it because we got nothing progressed further at all. At all. Literally, in the case of... Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt storyline, it's just at a stall. Like, they began last week, they got everybody buzzing, and then this week you gave us literally nothing. And we will get to that as we move along. Let's get to this match card before I babble myself to death. And this show was from The Q in Cleveland, the historic site of the infamous Boiler Room Brawl that took place at In Your House Between The Undertaker and Mankind. An absolutely tremendous and an absolutely inspiring performance by both men. A match that will live in the annals of time as one of the greatest to go down probably in that building. This Raw would not follow suit at all. It would be actually the complete opposite of what that night was. Believe me. Samoa Joe starts off this night. He comes walking out to the ring. He says he's not impressed with all the members of the Shield. He's beaten them all already. It doesn't matter to him. And if Roman's got a problem with that, he can come out and say some shit to his face. That's essentially what Samoa Joe said. Of course, what's going to happen? Roman Reigns comes out. Fisticuffs, shenanigans, the brawl ensues. The bar comes out. Of course... Joe ends up locking up Roman Reigns in the Kimura lock. Gets it on nice and tight. He has it on for quite some time, too. And Rollins and Ambrose obviously would come out to try to make the save. But Samoa Joe and the bar would end up standing victorious, leaving the entire shield laid out in the middle of the ring. So the show started off okay. I, as I've been saying every single week, 
and they kind of make me kind of eat my words a little bit, especially again tonight. But how many times can we see the same pairings of these guys go at it? And I'm I'm bored of the bar versus the shield at this point. I've seen it so much in the last three months during this lead up to the shield reunion, during the stall of the shield reunion while Roman Reigns was out with the mumps and all the other meningitis nonsense that was going around and it just completely stalled the gimmick and then we got to see them fight the bar with all other guest shield members and then we got one on one matches and two on ones and two on twos back and forth at this point I'm tired of but they do keep delivering when their matches hit the ring and there should be no surprise I've said it on this show before, when you wrestle each other constantly, your matches should continuously be getting better and better and better. And that seems to be the case with this certain group of guys. They are all very good on their own, but they seem to be making each other better. So you can't complain about it too much, although I am getting very bored of seeing this storyline. I want it to come to a head, culminate, and go away, and let's start moving away from it, seeing where these guys can go. Uh, Cesaro, specifically tonight, proved that he can go on his own. He could be world heavyweight champion, intercontinental champion, probably should be intercontinental champion. He proves that almost on a weekly basis. Tonight would be no different. We'll delve more into that a little bit later on. After this whole thing with the Shield and the Bar and Joe, we would go to the first woman's segment of the night. And it would be all downhill from this moment on. We had Bailey and Mickey James with Sasha Banks, of course, because we have to get all the women in one segment, going up against Paige and Mandy Rose, who will be making her Monday Night Raw in-ring debut with Sonya Deville in their corner as well. As you could imagine, this was not good. This match was not good. Mandy Rose is not good. She's beautiful. I don't care what you say about that because I don't watch wrestling to see pretty girls. We've been through this time and time again. We've lived this already with Eva Marie and with the whole entire Divas division from the year like 2014 all the way up until the revolution began. I don't want to just see pretty women walking around in the ring in skimpy outfits. There might be some of you guys that that's what you want out of your women's wrestling, but that's not what I want. I want competition. I want girls that know their craft. I want girls that respect and love the industry and want to get better every day and prove it by actually getting better every day. Girls like Peyton Royce and Billy Kay. Girls like Ember Moon and Asuka, who they prove time and time again they don't know what they're doing with with Asuka either. But this was just a train wreck of a match. Before the match, the girls from the Absolution would come out after we had Mickey and and Bailey and Sasha in the ring. I don't even get that trio. Like, what is that even about? There's no backstory behind it. It's just a random pairing just because we have a trio in the Absolution on the other side. So, you know, God forbid... They actually have the advantage, and it's a three-on-two against two best friends. Now we're just bringing in Mickey James for no reason to even the odds and and what? To even the odds in a a tag team match? It was two-on-two. Like, what? I I, I don't get it. That's that's the least of the the problems in this. The Absolution comes out. Paige has something to say. I don't mind Paige having something to say. But the minute the blonde one and the boxer get their hands on the mic, I don't want to hear it. There is absolutely nothing they can add to this show. They should not be allowed to speak yet. They've only been around for a few weeks. They are overstepping their bounds, in my opinion. And let's get right down to the nitty-gritty. The writing for these two was completely cringeworthy. Whoever is scripting this garbage for them, your beatdown is going to be a symphony and the music is starting, or whatever. I probably said it more creatively than they came up with it. Oh my god. Mandy Rose lost her place. You could see it. It happened. It happened live on TV. She was talking and talking and talking, and then she just stopped. She didn't stop because of the crowd, because the crowd couldn't care less. 
Nobody was making a peep. They weren't even booing because they just didn't care. And silence is the worst reaction you can get in the world of pro wrestling. What more proof do you need? Same said for Sonya Deville. Doesn't matter what they had to say. Nobody cared. Nobody was listening. It was all unnecessary. Paige could have said what she had to say. They could have hit the ring. They could have started this match. And that should have been the end of it. These two should not be saying a word. They look awkward enough as it is. Just standing beside Paige. This this faction just visually does not work. Mandy Rose sticks out like a sore thumb. It just doesn't work. It doesn't fit. I don't care about their tough enough connection or their NXT friendship or whatever bullshit backstory you want to throw on it. It looks terrible. It's not working and you're overdoing it because this would not be the last time we would see the absolution on this night. This match was not that long. It was not great by any means. Last week's match between Paige and Sasha Banks was by far Far and away, much better than what we got tonight. The Absolution wins. Who cares? Do you? Because I certainly don't. Let's talk about Bray Wyatt and Broken Matt Hardy. We're not going to talk about it long, which is a surprise to me. If you watched the show last week, you know how excited I was and how I was anticipating this night just for this moment. I wanted it to be Monday tomorrow. Remember? I would have regretted it. I would have. Because I, I am already upset with putting my faith into the WWE to allow this to really grow and be something. How can you go out there and give us literally the same segment you gave us last week which is probably the third time I've said this now as pertaining to what we've seen on this card, and expect us to be excited. What did we see that was any different than last week? We got, what, two more minutes of Matt Hardy's laugh? I, I, I don't know. It doesn't bother me. I enjoyed it. I'm not telling you I didn't enjoy it, but I was expecting a little bit more. Why not have Bray Wyatt in the ring and Matt Hardy on the Titan Tron? Have the exchange that way. Just to change it up a smidge. You don't have to put them in the ring yet together. I understand you want to build a story. But repeating what you did last week because everybody thought it was so great. Not really what I was looking for. Not really what I was looking for. You don't have to race to the finish line. But a little baby step forward would be appreciated. Not just standing still in one place because that place was pretty awesome last week. We did have something a little creative that I did take note of that Matt Hardy's kind of going with and I'm a little interested in seeing if they're really going to play into it or it's just something he's saying to get into the head of Bray Wyatt but he had made mention of the fact that Sister Abigail's essence her soul, her existence has been around for centuries which makes you want to believe that the entity that is Within his broken brilliance, Matt Hardy, the guy that's controlling his vessel, right? <laughs> you want to kind of think that he knows Sister Abigail. Like the, maybe they used to be buds back in the 1500s or something. Roaming around like Lestat and, and the Queen. You know what I mean? Who knows what craziness is going on in Matt Hardy's mind. But I find that infinitely intriguing. He claims that she is trapped in the vessel that is known as Bray Wyatt. I think that's very intriguing, and I would I would love for them to really take that thread and pull on it a little bit. Unravel that story a little bit. Especially with the tease that we got prior to Halloween and prior to Meningitis saving the day and having that whole Sister Abigail thing nixed with the Pumpkin King, uh, Finn Balor, leading into that feud that they had going on and like if sister abigail is trapped inside bray wyatt maybe that is matt hardy's mission to extract her from him and save her and deliver her back to where she belongs i don't know that would be great see i just that's what i mean like i'm just sitting here spitballing with you guys and i just came up with that little nugget based off of one sentence that matt hardy said why can't they be as creative as that let's hope that that's the road 
that they're going down. But that's really the only thing that I noticed. You know, in Cleveland, I thought that they were a much more wrestling-oriented town, but they did not seem interested in this show too much tonight, even in this segment, which you would think everybody would be interested in, right? Like, everybody's looking for this, waiting for this, as I was. But they seemingly didn't care, because nothing new happened. And I bet they felt like they seen this last week, because they did. And while we're talking about Cleveland, where is Cleveland? Cleveland is in Ohio. Who is from Ohio? The Miz, obviously, we know. The Miz is off with his pregnant wife. God bless them. Hope everything's going well, right? Who else is from Ohio? The noticeably absent Raw Women's Champion Alexa Bliss. Where was Alexa Bliss? They're in her hometown. Or her home state. I believe she's from Columbus. It can't be that far. From Cleveland, Ohio. Hometown girl comes home. How many people bought a ticket that night to go see their girl, right? To go see their hometown girl perform. Cheer for Alexa Bliss. Where was she? They didn't even pull the commentary BS that they usually pull. Alexa Bliss missing from the show, airing from her home state. Does that make sense to anybody else? I don't know. We certainly got enough of Paige. Mandy Rose got her friggin' screen time. But we didn't get the champ tonight. Normally I wouldn't mind, but considering the location of tonight's Raw, definitely made no sense. Finn Balor would be wasted again this week, although last week I didn't mind too much because it was a clash of two former NXT champions, which actually was a fairly decent match, although it wasn't given enough time to really do anything. Tonight would be the exact opposite of even that, as he was put in there with second generation, third generation superstar, Curtis Axel, who's walking around sporting a phony neck brace, selling a phony neck injury, and goes out there and has a comedy match with Bray Wyatt, I'm sorry, with Finn Balor, that lasted maybe, what, three minutes? Three wasted minutes. Finn Balor has been relegated to what you what would what would you consider the mid card, right? It, would you consider it a wasteland? I don't know. Maybe that's a little extreme. The mid card is where people go to die in the WWE. The mid-card championship is sitting on the number one guy in the company, right? So, And the universal championship is sitting on a part-timer who's making $6 million a year to do nothing. So what is the mid-card? The tag team division has now been swallowed up by the shield and the bar. So when you go to the mid-card, essentially, you are on Vince McMahon's island of misfit toys. All the little... Cool gadgets and cool toys and trinkets that all the kids would love, but he don't want to play with them. He don't want to give them away. He don't want to use them for whatever reason. Maybe because their skin's too pale or they got polka dots like the poor little elephant in the Rudolph movie. You know? Nobody wants a Charlie in the box, right? Everybody wants Jack. That's what I feel like has happened when you go to... The mid card, you become a Charlie in the box. And Vince don't want you. He only wants Jack in the boxes. I'm sure that is an analogy that makes sense somehow. And it just infuriates me to no end. How a talent like Finn Balor, with potential that is just off the charts, and a character that is just amazing, is just thrown to the wayside and, and wasted in a mid card and going absolutely nowhere. When you're wrestling guys like Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel, you definitely don't mean anything. It doesn't matter whether you win or lose. Beating a loser does not make you a winner. So, I'm sorry about that, Mr. Balor. He did get the win, like I said. Three minutes, coup de gras, done deal. Waste. We would get to see Kane's promo. God forbid we... 
we don't get to see Kane speak. It wasn't even worth listening to, and I didn't. Then we would get treated to the first very good match of the night, which was Seth Rollins versus Sheamus. Very, very good. The story here, Sheamus would try to take out the legs, trying to disable the wheels of the architect, Seth Rollins. Very great storytelling in this one, despite having the bad leg, though. Seth Rollins would overcome the bigger and stronger Celtic warrior, hitting him with that injured knee, with that little running knee strike he likes to do that he stole from Kenny Omega, and would get the 1-2-3 victory. It was a very good match. It was hard fought. It was back and forth. It was not as good, however, as Cesaro's match with Roman Reigns, as hard as it is for me. To admit that, it is a fact. And that's what we do here. We report the facts. We'll get to that in a minute. The Cruiserweight Second Chance Fatal 4-Way. This is happening because of what went down with Rich Swan over the weekend and his arrest. So he has been suspended indefinitely. We covered that in our story that we put up on the channel yesterday. If you missed that, you can go check it out. And... I was very interested in this match. We had gotten some very good cruiserweight action on the last few weeks in this Fatal 4-Way format. Although I am tired of seeing Fatal 4-Ways, it, it did make the most sense to take the remaining competitors that did not advance and allow them all to have a second chance at qualifying. Tony Nese, Musafa Ali, Arya Davari, and Cedric Alexander. Like I said, another very good Cruiserweight match. Very, very good highlights to close this match up. However, the star of this segment would be Drew Gulak. Good old Gabba Gulak, right? He is quickly becoming one of my favorite people on the entire roster. His sense of humor and his delivery and everything about his character and the no fly zone and his pairing with Enzo. And everything he said at that commentary booth tonight. Absolutely hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. The most entertained all night was I when he was speaking. However, I could live without Michael Cole in the interrogation. That was getting a little bit of uh, on my nerves. It was grating me a little bit because Cole just wouldn't drop it. He kept pushing Gulak about what are you going to do if you have to face Enzo. Well, what are you going to do if you have to face any of your friends in the Zo train? This was not an important question. Definitely not important enough for him to be acting like we were on 2020 or Nightline or some nationwide real interview show that he was grilling Drew Gulak like this was the biggest thing to happen in all of sports that he needed to know the answer to. I could have definitely done without that, but... Aside from that, his commentary was absolutely great, as was this match. It was very, very good. The end sequence would see Cedric Alexander deliver a springboard spinning roundhouse kick and then would turn his attention to, I believe it was Tony Nese coming back into the ring. He would get a spin kick to the face and then would deliver a beautiful lumbar check to Arya Davari for the win. One, two, three. Cedric Alexander will be taking the place of Rich Swan in this one on one matchup next week on Raw versus Drew Gulak to see who faces Enzo Amoron for the Cruiserweight Championship. Definitely one of my favorite moments of the night. And it's very rare that I get to say that, especially when we are talking about the Cruiserweights. This would be followed by another very good match. Very surprised to say this, and we talked about it just a second ago. Roman Reigns versus Cesaro. Just like last week, let's let's call a spade a spade, and let's put it out there where I got to put it out there. All right, Roman Reigns is a capable pro wrestler. You put him in the ring with somebody who's better than he is, like... Last week with Jason Jordan, we got that again this week with a top-notch talent like Cesaro. And you get an excellent version of Roman Reigns. Because it's not that he can't wrestle. He knows how to wrestle. It's a genetic thing. The Samoans all got it. 
He's just being instructed to be bland. Okay? And this match, regardless how good it was, would be tainted by the finish. And not because Roman Reigns would win this match, but because of the way he would go about winning this match. Going into this match, even though it was an open challenge for the Intercontinental Championship, you knew he wasn't going to lose. Much like I said earlier, when you are talking about the road to WrestleMania, you are not going to have Roman Reigns be blemished on this road because the ultimate goal is to have the Universal Champion versus the Intercontinental Champion and fully crown him. There is no further they could go with him. That is the very last chance they have. It's not going to work, but that's the goal. So you know Cesaro's not going to win. However, this match was that good that many times I actually thought Cesaro did win. The two counts were so close. And my problem with it comes, like I said in the finish, Cesaro would dominate the closing moments of this match. Absolutely ferociously firing off elbows and hitting Roman with everything he had to the point where Roman Reigns looked like he could barely even stand up. You were waiting for Cesaro to deliver one final maneuver when out of nowhere Roman Reigns would muster up the strength to nail that spear and the match would be over. Cesaro, who was much fresher than Roman Reigns was, much more full of life. You know, he had the upper hand. He was not as winded. He was... Roman Reigns came into this match. He was injured, supposedly, during the altercation earlier in the night. He was not 100%. They kept making it a point to put it out there over and over. Oh, Roman's not 100%. Something's wrong with his arm. And that would be the factor that they would play on. The storytelling here would be great. Just like in Seth Rollins' match, they focused on a particular limb. In this case, it would be Roman's arm. He would be thrown into the corner ring post. Cesaro would do everything he could to try to get Roman Reigns to tap out. He would caught him in a cross face. He was doing everything he could to de- uh, <clears throat> to detach that arm from Roman's body. And it was a thing of beauty to watch. It was absolutely great psychological wrestling. Cesaro is fantastic. He made Roman look great. But the finish, that out of nowhere, 1980s Hulk Hogan, 2000s John Cena, out of nowhere, I get my ass kicked for for 15, 20 minutes and then win with one move thing is the whole problem with the character of Roman Reigns. It's why nobody that's over the age of 17 likes him. It's why nobody, no man that is a self-respecting wrestling fan is a true fan of Roman Reigns because he's not the guy. He's that guy. He's that John Cena guy. He's that money t-shirt selling guy. He's not this guy. He's not the wrestling guy. He's not the Daniel Bryan guy. He's not the guy you want to get behind. He's the guy the company's going to push. So let them push him. He's never going to be the guy. Even though he could put on top quality matches, the key factor is he needs a great talent on the other side. And when you are the guy, you're supposed to be that great talent on the other side. He's supposed to bring Cesaro to the good match, not vice versa. But no matter who brings that great match out, I'm always appreciative of great pro wrestling. And we did get that despite the finish. And that would be that for Roman and Cesaro. Braun Strowman cuts a promo to counter Kane's promo from earlier in the night. Did you care? I didn't care. Oscar versus Alicia Fox was booked. And I want to take a moment to, you know, give a big middle finger to Michael Cole because he is the worst Worst. He's always been and continues to be the worst at his job because he says things like Alicia Fox took Asuka to her limit last week on Monday Night Raw. In a four and a half minute squash match of Alicia Fox where she got in a minimal amount of offense, an amount of offense she shouldn't have got in nonetheless, but it was minimal. 
Asuka did sell a little too much to make this look like it was more than it was from Alicia Fox. But this moron has the balls to say that that was Asuka's limit. Did you not see her fight against Nikki Cross at TakeOver? You think that match with Alicia Fox is Asuka's limit? How dumb are you? Who fed you that piece of garbage line? Holy cow, you guys. Terrible. Alicia Fox would never even make it out to the ring. Asuka was the first one out. Alicia Fox would not make it out. And the Absolution would grace us with their presence again. And immediately, I did not care once again, which is a shame. I would have much rather this have been a one-on-one altercation between her and Paige. Having the minions out there with her just brings her down, man. Brings her down 110%, and I can't, I can't stand it right now. And this whole thing with Asuka doesn't even make sense. Why are we not focusing our attention on the women's title? Shouldn't that be Asuka's priority right now? Because nobody's ready for Asuka, right? She should be on a march to the women's championship. I proposed on an earlier episode that this particular storyline should culminate at Raw 25. The 25th anniversary show is the go-home show for the Royal Rumble. And that the winner of that match should go on and face Alexa Bliss at the Royal Rumble for the Royal Women's Championship. But in hindsight, I'm sitting here going, why would they derail Asuka on her road to the title? Does she deserve it at WrestleMania? Sure she does. But I also think that there's not enough female talent to drag this out all the way until April. They got to pull the trigger while the trigger's hot. And Asuka is the hot property right now. She should be treated as such. And there is nobody that can stop her. And she should be given the title as soon as possible. And then have her be the champion. And dominate the division. Just like she did in NXT. Until you find the one. To put over. To be Asuka's equal. And have them put over the whole entire women's division together. With a great rivalry. Kyrie Sane comes to mind. That's just me spitballing. But that's the proper way to go about this. Why she's wasting her time and why she's being attacked by the absolution the way she's been attacked tonight. Obviously, Paige is looking to make a name for herself. Why isn't she going right for the championship? Why is she going for Asuka? There's no story really behind it. It's just a random like, well, I'm back. You're new. I'm going to pick on you. I got friends. You don't. But at the end of this segment tonight, apparently Asuka does have friends as the entire woman's roster would come out and save Asuka from this beatdown by two jobbers and a returning former superstar. Granted, her match, like I said last week, Paige with Sasha Banks was good. So Paige, as always, is a threat in the ring. But even to Asuka, that threat is scaled back a little bit. And I just did not enjoy this segment whatsoever. Two failed women's segments tonight. Absolutely terrible. I will give them credit, though, for allowing there to be at least two and a half hours to pass before I had to see Jason Jordan's adopted wrestling son face and his little puppy dog eyes crying to his daddy that he wants a match with Samoa Joe. Is somebody checking this kid's mental capacity? Who in their right mind wants to fight Samoa Joe? Nobody. It even took Roman Reigns a few minutes at the beginning of the show. He took awkwardly long getting out there. Because he was thinking twice. Because you, nobody wants to fight Samoa Joe. Absolutely ridiculous. Kurt Angle would finally have enough and snap and be like, Hey, listen, adopted son. You will get your match when I say so, not when you want it. And Jason Jordan stormed off like a bratty five-year-old child. And that would be... The end of that segment. It would not be the last we would see of Jason Jordan. As he would decide to plant himself at ringside, not ringside, at the top of the stage. Much like Samoa Joe did last week during Roman Reigns' match with Jason Jordan. Jordan's sitting watching in a steel chair. Looking like a porno stripper. Like a Chippendale stripper. Making all kinds of stupid smirky faces. Like a stupid kid. I'm sitting here. Here I am. I'm sitting here watching you, Joe. Mm. 
It was awkward. It was stupid. And he had no business being out there. I understand they're trying to tell the story, but this story sucks. And anything that has to do with Jason Jordan sucks right now, unless he's wrestling. When he's wrestling, he's spot on and he's fantastic. Anything he tries to do dramatic or tries to perform outside the ring, go away. I don't want to see it. In this case, he would prove to be a detriment to the match, but not to the victory that would come to Samoa Joe as he would take on Dean Ambrose. Jason Jordan would make his way to ringside eventually, get himself interjected into this match, which would cause a, disqual- uh, which would cause a distraction long enough for Samoa Joe to end up getting the win over Dean Ambrose in a decent match here. But like I said, they kept cutting to Jason Jordan sitting at the ramp, and every time they showed me his face, I was just absolutely terrified. <laughs> I don't know, but it's just like, oh, why? Can I please just see this match? It was very good. It was a very physical match. This the uh, the lunatic angle of Dean Ambrose definitely played well against the barbaric Samoan nature of Samoa Joe. Man, they definitely were throwing some haymakers, and they looked like they were going all out. And uh, like I said, ruined by Jason Jordan. But that will definitely not be the last we see of that story. Who knows what next week is going to bring? In what might be one of the worst segments of the night as well, we would be forced to see Titus Worldwide backstage. And they've made it even worse. How could you make something that's bad even worse? Well, you add Dana Brooke to it. You add Dana Brooke to it. We had Titus O'Neil in the back with Apollo, who was doing a very, very awkward and very bad scripted promo he was saying some sort of weird mumbo jumbo i couldn't even make it out it was like really bad street slang or like old country slang something it didn't sound right i didn't enjoy it at all apparently dana brooke is the new status uh, statistics person statistician and the head of research and development for titus worldwide what does she know about development She hasn't developed anything except a big gut. Her development is zero. She's exactly the same as she was when she entered NXT. She wasn't even given a chance to learn and grow down there. And what has she done since being on the main roster? She was Charlotte Flair's lackey for a while. She was with Emma, which was the only thing that was actually kind of decent. And since then, she was what? She was with the nurse. She was a nurse with Gallows and Anderson. She's a living, breathing, flesh embodiment of Miss Piggy. If Miss Piggy was a person, she'd be Dana Brooke. I don't want to see her on my TV. So they took her big, pink, heaping pile of garbage ass and stuck it on top of the heaping pile of garbage that is Titus Worldwide. And just made it even worse. Congratulations. Fan-fucking-tastic. Are you kidding me? The less we see of Dana Brooke, the better. And now they're putting her with these two jackasses? Oh my god. The future is not looking bright. And the end is nigh. And the end is nigh here on the show because this would be the end of the review. We talked already about Braun Strowman and Kane. We already discussed the main event. We're not going to go back into that. We are 48 minutes in, and if you are still here, and if you enjoyed this show, thank you so much for being here and and taking this journey with us tonight after a terrible edition of Monday Night Raw, which I hope I don't ever have to watch again. And I'm sorry to you guys that you had to watch it yourselves. That was the worst main event I have seen all year. It was a detriment and a black mark on the career of Braun Strowman. He did not deserve it. I was hoping more than anything that this would be the last time we've seen Kane ever until he was inducted in the Hall of Fame. Apparently, that's not the case. If you liked this show, don't forget to smash that like button, punch that thumbs up right in the face, share this video with all your friends all over social media, get it out there. Let the world know the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show is here and we are bringing you the absolute best coverage and the best opinions in all of the YouTube 
wrestling community, the newest, fastest rising podcast in all of YouTube. That is the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show right here on Sledgehammer TV. My name is Nick Nightmare. This is my little buddy, my loyal companion, and world hag team. Now I do that all the time. Let's try it again. World heavy weight champion of microphones. Maybe one day we'll be the tag team champs. Maybe I'll find a way to get him a belt and me a belt, and we will be the tag team champions of YouTube right here on the one and only Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. Thank you guys so much, and we will be back here tomorrow night for your review of SmackDown Live. Hopefully, it's better than tonight, because this one was a doozy. Thank you so much. I love you guys. See you next time. We'll be right back.